Okay, I'm going to do the workup on primary immunodeficiencies. Uh, I want to start off by saying that there was no single source that you can go to for information on a workup. So working up immunodeficiencies, it's going to require you to be familiar with a lot of the immunodeficiencies and uh, familiar with the immune system in general. With that said, I also want to point out that there's a great article on UpToDate called Flow Cytometry for the Diagnosis of Primary Immunodeficiencies. Flow Cytometry is what we need for our case at the point we're at. But Flow Cytometry includes a, probably a hundred different things and a hundred different ways to diagnose the 150 plus immunodeficiencies that have been documented. So just being a little bit cognizant of the types of immunodeficiencies will direct you in what kind of flow cytometry you want to look at. So what are the hallmarks of a primary immunodeficiency? The first thing is you want to have recurrent inf infection or an unusual infection such as a, an opportunistic infection. The, um, the disease typically will start in childhood. It can start anywhere from a few months old, one month old, all the way up to the second or third year of life. And in some cases, immunodeficiencies don't present until like age seven or eight, depending on what kind it is. Also, if you have abnormal blood counts, especially on your leukocytes, you're going to look at immunodeficiencies as a possibility. The thing to keep in mind with recurrent infections, typically a recurrent infection is indicative of an anatomical abnormality not an immunodeficiency in most cases. So for example, while I was putting together this presentation, uh, this afternoon I talked to a cousin of mine who has recurrent ear infections. She says she gets an ear infection almost at a light, being out in a light breeze. My first thought was not primary immunodeficiency, or even immunodeficiency at all, my first thought was, I wonder what's going on with the eustachian tube. And that's the primary reason whenever in our case this week we have a, an, a young girl who has recurrent pulmonary infections, recurrent pneumonia, and the thought was, well, perhaps there's a transesophageal fistula. This fistula is allowing bacteria easy access from the gut into the lungs. However, just a precursory look over the case, looking at the, the white cell count, the differential, you can easily see that this is probably not the case. So the rest of this presentation is going to be primarily algorithmic. You have a recurrent infection. That recurrent infection is either an unusual infection, a persistent infection, or there's a low blood count. You can't find an anatomical abnormality that would explain the persistent or unusual infection. You want to consider a primary immunodeficiency. Now some sources that I've read said when working up a primary immunodeficiency you cannot immediately rule out an acquired immunodeficiency. So an HIV test would be warranted for this young child even though she was born in the US which Typically, mothers are screened for HIV whenever they are pregnant with a baby in the U.S. In some situations, that test can be turned down for any number of reasons. The key to working up the rest of your diagnosis will be first asking yourself, where is the location of the infection? And what are the characteristics of the infection? So, for example, in our case, we had some sinopulmonary infections. We had upper respiratory with the, the runny nose. We had lower respiratory with the pneumonia. Antibody and complement deficiencies are listed in both of these as possible causes. So what should we do? We, we could check the Ig levels in the serum, do antibody titers to the vaccines that she's been vaccinated against, and do the CH50, which is a look at the complement. So just as an interlude, let me ask you, what kind of things can go wrong with the immune system? And I've just listed a few of the various components of the immune system. There are several more, and each of these things can, can have something go wrong. So 
You got the B cells that can go wrong, the T cells, the complement. You've got the phagocytes. You can group it as adaptive immunity. You can group it as innate immunity. Or you can group it as combined components of both. So let's suppose we're suspecting a complement deficiency. What symptoms do we look for? With a C1 inhibitor, you're going to look for edema. Uh, and I, that's basically explained by overactivation of the calcarine uh, system. With the C1 inhibitor is also responsible for uh, components of the calcarine system as well as the clotting cascade. With other various components of the complement, you look at ear infections, pneumonia, bacteremia, meningitis, and gonorrhea. So meningococcal or any type of Neisseria infection, the membrane attack complex is actually going to easily destroy a cell that has a, a thin cell wall. And Neisseria have thin cell walls, so the membrane attack complex, if there's a problem with C5, C6, C7, C8, or C9, you're going to have uh, uh, recurrent Neisseria infections. So what kind of tests can you do? You can assay for the C1 esterase inhibitor, or you can do a complete complement assay, which will include the CH50. And then you have various options for treatment. Suppose you were suspecting a phagocytic cell defect. The physical exam, you may find problems in skin, GI tract, lymph nodes, musculoskeletal, pulmonary, or constitutional uh, signs. There are some lab tests you can do. These would include the respiratory burst, which you're looking for chronic granulomatous disease, flow cytometry to look at the various levels of the different leukocytes. You look at the serum IgE. Now, CBC with diff, whenever you do a CBC with differential, all of the sources I've, I've read that talk about this say that the differential, the manual differential is going to be more accurate and give you better results and better information than the, than the automated differential. And you're going to also want to look at the ESR and the CRP. Now, the C-reactive protein is an acute phase reactant, and there are a couple of different immunodeficiencies that will re have a lower uh, level of acute phase reactants. And basically how that works is you have the different cytokines that are delivered from the various leukocytes to the liver and cause the liver to start producing things like C-reactive protein. One example of this I can think off the top of my head is a MyD88 deficiency and an IRAC4 deficiency. These are both components of the immune system that, si that are in the signaling cascade for the production of interleukin-1, interleukin-6, uh, IL-12, and tumor necrosis factor. And so if you have a defect in these, which it would be you would have a, a cell in the, in the innate immunity that would have a pattern recognition receptor, and if that pattern recognition receptor binds to something and then MIDI-88 or IRAC-4 doesn't respond to it, then you're not going to have the increased CRP. And in that same vein, some infections you would expect, hey, you should have a really high fever but you don't have the high fever either because you don't have those uh, cytokines being produced. Now I get most of these algorithms from the Primary Immunodeficiency Foundation and so oftentimes they're, they're going to say refer to an immunologist and I think this is probably smart if you're not an immunologist doing this but some of you are going to be an immunologist someday or at least you're going to be really well versed in immunology. However, any, anyhow, the treatments refer to an immunologist, that, that's not really a treatment, it's just something you do to help ensure that you have the right diagnosis. Anyhow, you can do antibiotics, gamma interferons, hematopoietic stem cell transplants, and treatment with antifungals depending on the specific deficiency and depending on the specific symptoms. Now let's consider cellular or combined defects. You're going to want to know the history of the present illness. And some things that would lead you to this row would be failure to thrive, reaction to a live vaccine, 
an unusual infection, intractable diarrhea, or viral infections. Important things on the physical exam. Serious cutaneous infections or abnormal cutaneous infections. And then also an absence of lymphoid tissue. Also, you can also look at a whether the lymphoid tissue is present or absent will direct you to one or the other different kinds of cellular or combined defects but in some of them if lymphoid tissue is absent that's going to point you down a specific path. The lab test you're going to want to do again CBC with diff and that's going to be manual diff. Uh, you check for lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, neutropenia and then treatments. Again this is not a retreat, uh, treatment but it is a recommendation uh, treatments are going to include immunoglobulin, stem cell transplant, and gene therapy. On that note, the very first successful gene therapy to ever be done was uh, done to treat se severe combined immunodeficiency. So uh, treat doing gene therapy is very experimental and it's getting better. However, you also have a severe uh, risk of things like lymphomas whenever you do these st gene therapies. Antibody production defect. Now I've got a lot of things listed here and so when you do your physical exam and history of present illness you're going to want to look at greater than two sites. If it's less than if it's one site or less where it's recurrent you're going to want to go again back and say is there an anatomical abnormality but if there's a if there's greater than two areas that are being persistently infected then you're going to want to think immunodeficiency and so the tonsils or lymph nodes are absent you have sinopulmonary infections otitis infections fever meningitis sepsis cutaneous infections GI autoimmune or cytopenia your lab test, I hope this is becoming apparent, CBC with diff is really important in narrowing down your differential. You're also going to want to do a quantitative IG, and then there's several specialized tests that you can do as well. Maybe you refer to an immunologist. What are the treatments? Typically, IG replacement. However, there's one exception to that. If you have isolated IgA, and you replace IgA, there's typically going to be an autoimmune reaction to that because the body has not been sensitized to IgA and it will react to it. So here's sort of an overview of everything. If you suspect antibody abnormality, do a quantitative Ig and then you look at the antibody's response to past immunizations. For cell mediated immunity, you do lymphocyte counts, you want to break it down between CD4, CD8, you may even break it down between naive versus activated and this is especially true with B cells and you also want to look for plasma cells and memory cells and differentiate those if you're suspecting a B cell problem. Again you want to look for HIV and then you do a delayed type hypersensitivity skin test like the PPD with uh, tuberculosis test to see uh, how that reacts as well. Complement problems, CH50 is what you want to do. Phagocytic problems, you do a neutrophil count. Also, nitrozoleum, a, a nitro blue tetrazoleum dye. This is for uh, tests for mainly for chronic granulomatous disease. Now, I'm not sure if that is an old test or not, but there is another test called the dihydrorhodamine test and a lot of the newer publications that I've looked at only list the dihydrorhodamine test some of them will list both of these tests now everything that we've looked at so far is something that I got from a source from primary immunodeficiency foundation what I'm going to show you next I spent probably uh, several hours putting together from probably about 40 different sources. I posted this on Box as a spreadsheet. I did that because I know if you're watching this on the TVs in the lab, you probably can't see any of these words. But I've got several different, uh, about 27 or 28 different immunodeficiencies. I've got those listed along the left hand column. For example, the first one 
Chetty Ekagashi, chronic granulomatous disease, TLR3 deficiency, Mighty88 deficiency. And then along the top, I've got uh, a column for the genetics of everything, uh, the blood profile, whether you're going to see T cells, B cells, what you're going to see in the IgG. Uh, then I've got basically the common manifestations, such as what kind of infections you're probably going to get. And then I've listed the major dysfunction. For example, lysosomal trafficking is the major dysfunction in Chetty Ekagashi syndrome. So here's a bird's eye view look at about 27 or 28 different immunodeficiencies. I want to say that these are all only going to be representative because according to the Immunodeficiency Foundation, there are over 150 known and documented immunodeficiencies. And some of it is confounding because some of the immunodeficiencies can be both familial, inherited, and acquired. For example, you can get an immunodeficiency from toxoplasmosis. That same immunodeficiency can also be inherited uh, in a completely different way. Now with that in mind, this chart is not going to help you at all if you don't have at least a solid background in immunology. I don't mean you need to be an immunologist, but you at least ha need to have a concept of how the immune system works. So I got most of these diseases from Robin's pathology, and a few more I picked up because they looked interesting off of reading up, reading up to date articles. But none of those sources listed all of these relevant pieces of information, so I had to go ahead and dig. Okay, last thing I'm going to do, take a couple minutes and look at some of the pertinent positives and negatives in our case this week. So first of all, I've, I went through and I've circled some of the things that we've seen in our case, and uh, we're going to look and see if that would fit. So the first one, we, we saw neutropenia. Uh, so do we have Chetty Ekagashi? The answer to that is probably not. Uh, no uh, melanocyte abnormalities noted, and um, so we don't have, probably don't have that. And in the leukocytes, whenever you look at those under the microscope, a lot of them are going to have giant granules, and that wasn't reported either. Next, I want to take a look at Mighty88 deficiency. This is the autosomal recessive um, so it would fit with the female having it. You usually will see it with respiratory and cutaneous infections. So uh, we did see respiratory and cutaneous infections. However, the typical causative organisms in this are Pseudomonas aeruginosa staph, and Staph aureus. I have to admit, I didn't really take a close look at the silver stain. I know that uh, from... Wikipedia, Pseudomonas aeruginosa will stain silver. However, the stain is m usually used for various species that are uh, fungal. There are a few other things about this uh, that look promising. Some sources, however, say you can get the uh, cytopenias that we saw, and others don't m say that it's not typical. So. Uh, we'll move on from that. IRAC4 and Mighty88 ha are going to have typical, um, typically the same clinical presentation, and so they're both about equally as likely. Next, complement. There are several different complement uh, abnormalities. The one I was looking at, C3, you get pyogenic infections and glomerulonephritis. Um, the reason I say glomerulonephritis, when we did the urinalysis, the uh, the specific gravity was at 1.010, and so we need to do another year analysis, honestly, because whenever it's fixed at 1.010, according to the Campbell-Walsh Urology 10th edition, when it's fixed at that number, it indicates kidney problems. So next, severe combined immunodeficiency disease, or SCID. This is a group of heterogeneous diseases. You can look at them in a couple of different ways. So there are the, the proper, I'll call them skid proper. And this includes the X-Link, the ADA, the VDJ recombinase, the JAK3, and the ILR7 types of skid. However, you can also classify a couple of other things as severe combined immunodeficiency. For example, DeGeorge syndrome, which is usually just called DeGeorge syndrome, is a type 
of severe combined immunodeficiency. Now we're dealing with a female patient who's just a couple months old and she has a father who is asymptomatic. So that will rule out anything X-linked recessive. The only thing that rules anything up, is, besides the fact that there's a disease, a recurrent disease, is the we see maybe failure to thrive. It's hard to really say it's failure to thrive or it's just uh, it's normal sickness because the, the baby lost some weight. Some of the other stuff you expect with skid, we don't see. We didn't see necessarily a morbilliform rash at birth. We didn't see extensive diaper rash and we would expect the the diseases, the susceptibilities to be all over the body. For example, skin, GI, everywhere. We've done an x-ray, we've seen a thymic shadow, we can rule out DeGeorge. Now there are several different types of hyper IgM. There is, and I don't think I put this on here, there's the CD40 L uh, hyper IgM and it's actually X-linked so we're not going to consider that but CD40 hyper IgM presents phenotypically the exact same way and it's autosomal recessive so we'll take a look really quick at the CD40 hyper IgM and the AID hyper IgM so on the blood what we're gonna what we would expect to see is a reduced number of B cells neutropenia in 66%, anemia in 15 to 32%, and thrombocytopenia in 4%. Well, we did see neutropenia, we did see anemia, we haven't seen thrombocytopenia. And the thing that rules this up over and above a severe combined immunodeficiency is SCID usually happens, or you usually see it around six months. This one we can see in the first months of life. Usually you're going to see sinopulmonary infections with encapsulated bacteria or an, an opportunistic infection like pneumocystic pneumonia. The few things that rule this down is we don't see hepatosplenomegaly, we don't see a GI infection, and we haven't yet seen lymphadenopathy. This is all the CD40. The thing with the, uh, the ADA hyper IgM, median age of onset is at 2. Then we got common variable, variable immunodeficiency, so if you went and looked at agammaglobulinemia, it would be similar to that, except in this case you'd see reduced plasma cells. I think we're seeing more, so, more than reduced plasma cells, but it, we are seeing reduced plasma cells. Then if you look at isolated IgA deficiency, increased respiratory, but we, we're not seeing urogenital, we're not seeing GI, so... I think we can rule that one down. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say that I think we need to do we need to check the interleukin levels for the mighty ADA IRAC4. We need to check the immunoglobulin levels for hyper IgM. And as Jared mentioned last week in class, I really think it would be important to get HIV serology. However, flow cytometry in general just to distinguish the subset of CD4, CD8, and CD27, I think it is, for activated B cells, and measuring the immunoglobulin response to the, the vaccinations that she's seen already. I think these are all important things to do. Complements pretty low on my differential, but I would also go ahead and get a CH50.